Well, welcome and good morning to another edition of Elevensies with Kevin Williams here of Survival Skills Rider Training. It's the 5th of May 2021. It's a reasonably bright morning here in London at the moment. Still a little bit chilly for the time of year. Um, still wrap up warm on the motorcycle when we're out and about kind of weather. Um, what have we got for you in the show today? Uh, Brembo are taking control of uh, J. Juan, the Spanish brake manufacturers. Um, so I've got some news on sites being seen, some good, some not quite so good. Uh, Lonsin Vosges 500DS. It's another Chinese adventure bike, and it looks like it's coming our way. Oxford Handy Sack, a folding helmet carrying rack sack, uh, which we will have a quick look at. And uh, we'll finish off with today's better biking tip, which is about group riding and keeping your distance and uh, a real life story from New Zealand about why we need to do that. So um, don't forget if you have any comments, any questions, uh, any feedback back on the show anything you'd like to ask um, for me to cover in another show do drop me a line and I will try to get back to you I'll certainly get back to you at the end of the show but uh, if I can I'll say hello as we go along um, so uh, what have we got so far we have Clive and Hallam both looking in and saying hello so good to see you guys uh, right okay so settle yourself down for the next uh, 30 minutes or so um, the Italian giant Brembo looks set to acquire a 100% stake in a Spanish brake manufacturer, J. Joan. I'll probably pronounce that horribly badly, but never mind. Um, if approved, the deal will cost Brembo about 70 million euro. Um, founded in 1965, J. Joan have three plants in Spain, one in China. Their revenue amounts to about 60 million pounds or euro, I should say, uh, back in 2020. And they employ about 500 180 people, so it's a reasonably sizable outfit. Um, they make brake components for motorcycles. Uh, they're best known for making brakes for the trials segment, but they do make bike brakes for zero motorcycles, calipers. Uh, you'll see, you'll find them on the zeros and a few other bikes. And the group is considered a world leader in the design and manufacture of metallic braided brake hose. Now, Brembo themselves have recently grabbed the brake pad manufacturer, SBA friction and the purchase of J. Joan and their brake hoses will basically give the brand what's known as a vertically integrated supply chain. In other words, they can supply everything that fits your bike in terms of brakes from top to bottom. And so their chairman, uh, Alberto Bombassi, Bombassi, he says uh, they're proud to welcome J. Joan to the Brembo Group. The transaction is in line with our global strategy and follows the recent acquisition of SBS Friction in Denmark. We continue to invest with the aim of strengthening our motorcycle core business. The addition is a great opportunity for us as it reinforces our position as a company increasingly oriented to offering comprehensive, integrated and high quality solutions to our customers. Okay, um, so uh, the Italian brand actually dominate the performance braking market. So you'll find them on the sort of top end bikes like Ducatis, for example. Um, but globally, Nissin are a uh, big competitor. So the idea is to basically take on the big boys. Um, the purchase is likely to close in the second half of this year, but it is subject to approval by antitrust authorities because they are taking over a competitor and they are narrowing the market. Um, so, all right, who's, uh, uh, Paul's also looked in and Hallam has a question about the Hurt report. Um, I'll, uh, that's an interesting point, Hallam. I'll have a look around for that one. What he's, what he's asked is um, basically the Hurt Report summary on Wikipedia. He notes that there's a lot about lack of helmets and eye protection. Um, have accidents changed much? Well, the accidents haven't, but the uh, head injuries certainly have. Eye protection, that's an interesting one. I don't know much about that. But certainly you'll find that head injuries have decreased in uh, countries where helmets are worn routinely. Um, you'll still find that they are uh, significant in uh, states in the US, for example, where helmets are not worn. Um, anyway, right. OK, so uh, second story of the day. Um, oh, I forgot to show you the picture of the damn 
break. Oh, look at that. I had, a, I had a photo for you to show you. Um, there we are. There's the brake caliper and the disc for you to look at. Um, they all look pretty much the same, really, don't they? But uh, hey-ho. Um, right, so moving on rapidly. Science of being seen. Um, I've got some good news and I've got some not so good news. Now, first of all, um, I, there was a huge turnout for my presentation online last week. Um, but with all the news on automated vehicles being used on UK roads, crashes involving Teslas uh, using self-steering, uh, arguments over smart, smart motorways and all the rest. I, I didn't have time to include that bit. So um, I actually got around 150 people in for the talk to Thames Valley Advanced Motorcyclists, which is fantastic. Um, Obviously, the uh, pandemic has meant that more people are getting used to using Zoom for events like this. So this was actually my biggest ever UK audience. Um, I think TVAM are still the biggest group of advanced riders in the UK, but I was still pretty gobsmacked to hear that they'd actually had to upgrade their Zoom subscription to the next level to cope with the demand for virtual seats. So I'm really pleased about that. And they got the full uh, science of being seen talk it lasts about uh, 40 minutes and uh, from that uh, we also had about 30 minutes of question and answer at the end of it and uh, I have to say um, the feedback was great too um, I had a couple of people uh, responding one Matt said uh, was that your talk about science of being seen last night for TVAM a superb presentation and a properly interesting subject I learned a lot thank you very much so thank you for that Matt and Ben said it was a great session last night Kevin thank you for taking the time we got it so that's very rewarding uh, feedback um, it's always good to get science being seen out to a receptive audience so uh, thanks to TVAM for the the opportunity to allow me to talk to them, uh, to your group. Uh, yeah, so very much appreciated and very and thank you for encouraging people to come out. Great news. So that's the good news. What's the slightly less good news? Well, um, you may well recall that I worked alongside Kent Fire and Rescue as part of their Biker Down instructor team for many years. We actually ran the first Biker Down course in Kent over 10 years ago down in Ashford. Um, in uh, over the winter of 2011-2012, I actually created the science of being seen to be part of the Biker Down package, and we ran it on the first few uh, pilot courses. Um, now, along with the post-crash accident scene management and the first aid modules, um, the reason for for doing science of being seen, which basically looks at junction collisions, is it was intended all along to be a crash prevention module. In other words, to equip riders better to understand why these collisions actually happen and then to do something about it, basically. So the, the value of the Biker Down package generally was quickly recognized. There was immediate interest from numerous groups. Um, you know, virtually every presentation we did, we had somebody sitting in on the course from somewhere, often other fire services, but, uh, you know, all sorts of other groups, including police and road safety. And of course, motorcycle clubs as well also used, were sending out representatives to see what it was all about and to see if we could do a specific one for them. And so I was very pleased, you know, uh, we were all very pleased later in the year when we actually were nominated for and then won a Prince Michael of Kent International Road Safety Award. And I was there at the award ceremony at the Savoy with the rest of the team when Jim Sanderson and Lowell Pater from KFRS actually collected the trophy from uh, Prince Michael himself. Now, Biker Down, uh, as a course, has been picked up by many of the fire and rescue services across the UK. It's also gone out to the military who've, uh, who've adopted a version of it, which is good news. And many of the teams actually do deliver a version of Science of Being Seen. And there's even a new Biker Down project starting out in North America. And I've been uh, working with the organiser over there to help them develop their own version of Science of Being Seen. But sadly, all good things do come to an end. And in recent days, I've heard from Kent that my involvement locally down there with Biker Down is coming to an end, thanks to COVID. Now, what's happened is, of course, they've not been able to run courses down there for over a year. The last one we ran was at the beginning of February when uh, I was pleased to be able to welcome uh, Brittany Morrow from the US over to sit in on the course. Um, but they are now deciding that they will be bringing all tuition in-house. I can understand why the reasoning for that is. I've also heard that the Science of Being Seen module will be rewritten internally, and that will 
be standardized across the fire services. So I will definitely miss those weekly uh, well, monthly trips down to Rochester uh, where they are held down at the, um, at the moment or will be hopefully uh, relaunched. I certainly miss the rest of the team. I've worked with uh, them for a long time, got to know them well, uh, thoroughly enjoyed their company and I miss the buzz of actually presenting live to a receptive audience down there as well. But uh, all things do move on. So I'm basically going to be continuing my research on uh, science of being seen and you'll be able to find and support that over on the science of being seen uh, site uh, this is the link to it um, do pop over there um, it's quite tech uh, or research heavy but on each section there is a handy little sort of 100 word summary of the page so you don't have to read all the uh the heavy going to get a flavor of what it's all about and i'll of course i'll be continuing to uh, update the original presentation myself with the latest research and i will continue uh, to deliver that research um, to you as science of being seen um, so if you are interested you can of course book your own session if you are a member of a bike group or a riding club um, why not drop me a line um, you can always get hold of me via my website and the contact app and the website's uh, address is there science uh, survival skills.co.uk easy enough to remember um, so drop me a line and uh, I'll, I'll happily set up your own uh, thorough and science-based presentation an investigation into the history of junction collisions and safety interventions basically um so right okay so moving on from science of being seen um i'll right Hall, um, hallam's just posted something about uh, riders using no eye protection um i'll i'll have a look at that and uh, i'll get back to you probably on a, another show there hallam rather than uh, talk about it today because obviously I've got topics uh, that I want to cover but I'll, I'll have a look at that and see what it's all about. I suspect the number of riders using eye protection has gone through the roof since 1980 when uh, the Hertz report was originally produced. Um, things do date. Right so okay um, where are we now? Well uh, don't forget you are watching uh, 11s and I would set a reminder if I were you to catch up every Wednesday and Sunday at 11. Um, you can also find the show afterwards here on Facebook of course and you can go to my YouTube channel Survival Skills UK and uh, watch over there if you missed it. So there we go. Um, Right, okay, so um, on with the next part of the show. Um, ch uh, Chinese motorcycles. Um, I've talked about them a lot recently, but there's a reason for that. Um, partly it's because I think that the Japanese and European manufacturers, such as Honda, KTM, and Ducati, are, um, and Triumph as well, actually, they're all moving further and further away from the more manageable and, let it be said, more affordable middleweight sector of the motorcycle market. Um, Triumph have recently brought out their Trident, but, um, you know, it's, it's a one-off bike at the moment. Um, and particularly in the very popular adventure bike market, um, they're all seeking to compete head-on with the highly successful BMW GS series and you know it's not really very surprising but what that's left is something of a hole in the mid-range now yes Honda have got their popular CB500X and the NC750 uh, X series there's also the perennial 650 V-Strom uh, that Suzuki uh, still provide uh, Kawasaki's Versus of course is still out there but I'd, I'd say they're all getting a bit long in the tooth um, you know the V-Strom's been around for god knows how many years now um, and yes okay the motor's been updated uh, the, the bike itself has um, been uh, it's sort of improved in looks um, but they are all pretty much under spec when you compare them with their bigger brothers and um, I would say if you're brutal as well and I am sometimes none of them are exactly dressed in the emperor's finery 
Um, you look at the Honda uh, Africa Twin. It's actually really, I think, a really nice looking bike. Um, and then you look at the V-Strom. And, I, you know, uh, worthy though it is, the V-Strom doesn't look a patch on the Honda. Um, they're all a bit ordinary looking. So perhaps it's not surprising then that the Chinese bike manufacturers who are looking to move up from the sort of cheap and cheerful entry level 125s um, all seem to have locked on to this uh, middleweight adventure bike as their entry point uh, into the European and uh, other markets. And um, it's worth pointing out really that just as the Chinese made motorcycles have cut the ground from under the Japanese at entry level, uh, you look at the number of uh, Lex Motos and things that are now sold at 125 level, um, it's likely that these sort of uh, mid range mid-price machines are likely to attract the attention of riders who are on a bit of a limited budget. Now the problem with Chinese bikes has always been seen as a lack of quality control, a uh, lack of overall reliability and general fit and finish. But the same criticism frankly could have been laid at the door of the original Japanese bikes. Um, and they didn't exactly have much of a bar to cross when it came to the competition, the 1960s British bike industry. Uh, you know, my granddad had one of those and uh, the every winter he stripped it, his BSA down on the kitchen table and rebuilt it. Um, you know, it's something that we really don't think about these days. So it didn't take the Japanese long to actually uh, reach the bar set by the British bikes and actually leap well clear of it as well. And it's not surprising, therefore, that the British bike industry didn't move, uh, folded in little more than a decade. So similarly, the Chinese machines are actually advancing pretty rapidly. And... Um, the uh, every iteration seems to bring the Chinese closer to Japanese design and quality. So take a look at that particular motorcycle. Um, that is the Lonsin uh, Vosges 500 DS. Um, now, um, if you put to one side the uh, rather dodgy Photoshop job there. Um, what do we know about Lonsin? Well, Lonsin are a huge Chinese manufacturer and Vosges is their sub-brand. And what they're promising is ever higher uh, levels of technology and quality. And one way they are achieving that is to include well-known suppliers for components. So basically ABS um, or Nissan brakes, uh, KY forks and Bosch ABS systems are all part of their range. And what they're attempting to do is establish themselves as a convincing alternative to the established Japanese or European brands. Now, Lon Sin, you may not have heard of them, but you may well have ridden one of their engines. Because if you owned a BMW F650 or a G650 model, um, you would, in fact, have been riding on a Lon Sin built engine um, designed by BMW. The same motor appeared in the Husqvarna TR650, incidentally. Um, so Lonsin really now, having uh, had that deal um, come to an end, I believe, they are spinning out into an even bigger range of their own machines. Um, so they've got baby ones, they've got 300, they've got the 500, and their biggest bike at the moment is a 650. And this 500 machine is now available in three variants. <coughs> There is a uh, sort of naked um, and the uh, the AC. I'm not quite sure what that one is. And then there's this Adventure Sport DS. And despite the really crap graphic there, I think it's quite an attractive looking machine. Now it carries the standard adventure bike styling. Uh, it's uh, got a 471cc parallel twin. It's liquid cooled, fuel injected, and it's of A2 friendly size as well. It comes with a 46 horsepower output and a 42.5 newton meters of torque. So it should punch along fairly happily. Um, wheels are 17 inch front and rear. They're alloy, as you can see. So they carry tubeless wheels, uh, tires rather, 120 at the front and a 160 at the rear. Rear. Um, the alloy rear carrier is a standard fitment as far as I know. I'm not sure about the uh, pannier kit though and the box and all the engine bars. Um, claimed weight is a little on the heavy side. It's uh, 188 kilos in the brochure but when you read it closely you'll notice that's dry weight. Um, so that's 420 odd pounds and the 17 litre tank will add another 17 kilos to that. So uh, by the time you actually fuel the thing up and fill it with oil you'll be looking at 
sort of 460 odd pounds, which is a little bit porky for a 500. Um, and that probably uh, helps account for the um, relatively modest 160 kph, 100 mile per hour top speed. So it's not going to rip up the tarmac, um, but it's not a dissimilar performance to the very similar CBX, uh, CB500X, I should say. Um, the motor does appear to be schematically very similar to that Honda, so hopefully that's under license rather than um, the old style Chinese knockoff. Um, the bike's got inverted forks, as you can see. The uh, digital display is TFT. Um, the uh, there it is. Um, all LED lights, uh, ABS and fuel ejection from Bosch, as I said, brakes from Nissan. And uh, will it sell? That's the big question. Well, it's been launched at 5,995 euros. That's around 500, uh, 5,175 pounds at the moment. Now look around and you can pick up the Honda CB500X for around about 6.2 right now. Um, so you have to weigh up the uh, problem of buying an, on a relatively unknown bike from a relatively limited selection of dealers against what you know you'll get from Honda. The difference in cost is a grand, and I dare say that some people will be quite happy to spend that on the Honda. Um, but there may well be quite a few who actually decide to take a punt on the Chinese motorcycles. So, okay, that's the Lonsin uh, Vosges 500 DS. Okay, now, um, something else that, um, that I'm never entirely happy doing is riding with a backpack on. Um, for various reasons, uh, which I won't go into right now, but um, the idea of being able to sling the helmet over your back uh, when you're off the bike is always useful. I've actually got a, a simple sling uh, that uh, clips into the uh, quick release a sort of seatbelt style catch on the helmet um, and you just throw that over your shoulder and that puts the helmet uh, sort of around your, around your shoulder and out the way. Um, but that sometimes actually carrying it on a backpack would be a little bit more convenient. So um, this here is the Oxford helmet carrying fold away rucksack. Um, basically it's a 15 litre backpack that folds away into an integral pocket, but you can also slip a helmet uh, full face will fit into a sort of pouch on the back of the backpack. Now, um, I will fully admit that this isn't the kind of material that you'd want to entrust your kit to on a round the world trip. But, uh, you know, if you're basically just jumping off the bike and heading into town to find a restaurant and you want to have your hands free while you walk, uh, or you don't want to leave the helmet on the bike at a race meeting and uh, you want to wander around the circuit without carrying it by the strap, it's the sort of thing that will do the job. Um, the bit that I particularly like about it is that's what it folds away into. That's a 15 centimetre by 15 centimetre pack. So that's roughly six inches by six inches. And it's just a, a sort of a couple of centimetres thick. Um, and you can fold that away basically into its own little pocket. And then you can shove it uh, in your your own riding kit pocket. You could pop it under the seat. You could carry it in a small tank bag. Um, you could uh, even carry it on your belt. There's a carabiner there, you'll notice, or there is even a belt strap. So you could put it on your jacket or on your trousers or something. Um, so there's plenty of options for carrying it, which makes it uh, basically very easy and very simple and straightforward to use. And uh, the good news is that uh, it's not, in fact, priced outrageously. Uh, $22.99 on the Oxford website. Uh, you can find it a bit cheaper if you look elsewhere. Right. OK, so don't forget, um, if you want uh, more riding, uh, riding, reading material, you can head over to my um, Lulu page, spotlight uh, forward slash survival skills. Uh, they do need those capital S's for some reason in the URL there. And you can check out my range of paperbacks that I've written over the years, um, all available to order and have delivered direct to your door. Um, so, OK, now. If you've been following this page at all for the last few years, you'll know that I've been working closely with the 
uh, New Zealand Transport Agency, their Accident Compensation Corporation and the Ride Forever Motorcycle Training Scheme that goes uh, out and delivers heavily subsidised rider training to uh, New Zealand, in New Zealand. Now, the Ride Forever courses are available at three levels. Uh, there's bronze, there's silver and gold, uh, and they can be retaken at regular intervals. Uh, you also net a discount on what's called the Rego over there, which is a, basically an annual levy on the bike. Um, it's somewhat akin to our own road tax. Um, it's always difficult to say whether a course of training is effective without a controlled study, uh, i.e. you would have to basically give somebody a, the course and then test them against another group who've taken some other kind of intervention to improve their riding and see what happens. Um, but there's plenty of anecdotal evidence that suggests that riders who do some training do actually get some benefits from it. So here's a story from a rider, Emily Gilbert, and she's convinced that what she learned on her Ride Forever course actually prevented a crash. Now, uh, the Timaru woman said it was lessons that she learned about riding in staggered formation when in a group and about being aware of her surroundings that meant that she slowed well in advance for a turn off State Highway 1 uh, towards Waimati. Uh, and what she said was, I knew I had other riders close behind me. I looked in my mirror and realized the bike behind was coming up fast. Uh, my following distance meant I could accelerate to get out of his way to give him more stopping room. Uh, unfortunately, the rider behind him was traveling too fast. Uh, he braked too hard, the front wheel washed out, and in my mirror I could see the bike somersaulting towards me. Thankfully, it stopped before it hit me, and the rider walked away unscathed. Now, that's a fairly typical sounding crash on a group ride. Um, you know, we tend to think about a lot of cornering accidents on group rides, but uh, there are a surprising number of these sort of uh, crashes in the group tail end uh, incidents, um, which all come from um, the dynamics of being in a bunch of riders. Um, and really, it's a key point to understand about group riding is, it's yes, it's good fun, but it does push up the the risk level and group riding is much overrepresented in crash stats. And here's the really interesting bit, of course, the kinds of crashes that we have don't really vary where we are in the world. Um, group rides in the UK, in uh, Australia and New Zealand, in the US, all have very, very similar crashes. So here in the UK, we have these kind of incidents, despite the fact we're 12,000 miles away from New Zealand and on an opposite side of the globe. Um, it's I've been actually been hit myself from behind uh, when leading a group ride in not dissimilar circumstances. And what happened was I was leading a group uh, in Luxembourg. We were all riding along the German border where there's a it's the boundary is actually a river at that point. And I, I took a right turn intending to go down to a ferry to get the uh, the boat over the the Rhine um, into Germany. And unfortunately, my buddy behind was uh, a bit close. He stopped uh, okay, but he had to do the hard braking thing. And rider number three was just too close to both of us. And he managed to swerve to avoid uh, my buddy, but he actually clipped my pannier. Now, fortunately for him and for me, uh, my pannier was the old throwover sort. So basically, it just ended up wrapped right around my neck. Uh, he had a big wobble, but uh, we both managed to maintain control of the bikes. But it could have been so much worse. We could easily have ended up with a bunch of bikes on the deck waiting for the ambulance. So um, what saved our rider out in New Zealand. Uh, well, um, Emily Gilbert is actually convinced that it was the staggered formation that she learnt about on that bronze level Ride Forever course, uh, which she took with Ornsby Motorcycle Training in Christchurch, incidentally. And she said that allowed her to see ahead and to react early, but also gave the rider uh, a bit more space when she did slow down. And she said the near miss had reinforced it for her mind the importance of a staggered formation when out riding and about maintaining following distance and about being aware of what's going on around you. Now, what I'll say to that is that staggered riding certainly has its place. It certainly works on straighter roads and it works at lower speeds in urban areas. Everybody gets that reasonable view ahead because rather than having a bike directly in front of you, you're offset 
to one side or the other and basically you get to see past that bike but you also get that ability to stop alongside it if you absolutely have to you shouldn't need to of course but it is there but that doesn't mean that we should stagger everywhere um it isn't appropriate for twisty roads the moment you get onto twisty roads um, then it really is important to open up into a single file so that each bike has room to use all the lanes so staggering is not something that should be used everywhere but that in turn means allowing for a sensible gap now I'll just have a quick look at this photo here um, that is a group of very experienced riders actually out in Australia. Uh, Australia, start again, in Austria, a uh, group trip I did a few years ago. And if you look at the following distances that they're using there, they are way too close. And if you look at the following distance that I'm employing behind the uh, bike in front of me, you'll see that I've probably left a much bigger gap than any of the other riders in that group. So um, ride too close to the biker in front and what's the problem well the first thing is the first issue is that you actually end up watching the rider in front rather than the road in front of you so basically you do what they do when they accelerate you accelerate when they brake, you break when they crash you crash um, if you watch youtube uh, it's absolutely full of videos from group riding incidents where one bike goes down and skittles the bikes behind because the riders behind haven't left enough space and in fact uh, you know a few years ago i came across three wrecked bikes that, uh, from a group ride that had all gone wrong out in kent it's one thing to have confidence in another rider uh, if you want to ride like john and ponch from chips um, but it's altogether uh, another thing to actually end up having the same crash with them. So the easy way to avoid that is to uh, open up the gap. And the, the best thing I find to do, generally speaking, on group rides is to actually let the rider in front get out of sight on a twisty road. That way, I ride my own ride. I'm not watching the rider in front and wondering what they're going to do or why they're doing it. I'm making my own decisions based on what I see. And if they're out of sight, I should have a good following distance behind them too. So I'm doing all the, uh, the, the, the riding decisions are all mine and I'm leaving myself plenty of space in front. Now, what about the rider behind? Well, hopefully the rider behind will respect our space on the road, but we do need to use our mirrors and check. And what do we do if the rider behind is a bit too close for comfort? Well, the answer is we open up the gap a bit more um, in front of us. So if we have to brake, that means we can brake more gently and that gives the rider behind time to see what's happening and then brake gently themselves. Um, and of course, if you leave a nice big gap in front of you, uh, there's always the chance that the rider behind you will stop hassling you and will go past you and start hustling the rider in front of them and once they're ahead of you of course you can set your own gap to your own comfort now one of the things that people worry about on group rides is that uh, they fear they're too slow um, something that one rider said to me uh, when asking about some advice for group riding a couple of years ago um, she said the other bikes just disappeared out of sight so I might as well have been riding by myself I felt a bit bad for them having to wait for me well what will I say to that well don't feel bad um, the only right pace for a group ride is your own pace it's not the pace that the leader is setting is not the pace that the rider ahead of you is setting is not the pace that the rider behind you wants to set you ride at your own pace and if you're comfortable with the group's speed then fine but if you're not don't chase faster riders. That way, calamity lies. There's always enough to ride uh, to worry about on the roads without worrying about what somebody else is doing and what they're thinking about us and trying to ride beyond our own personal limits just to keep them happy. Um, somebody also said uh, after I'd written an article about uh, group riding, it's all good, well and good, but it's hindsight. Uh, well, yes, I've, I mean, I've learned from group riding mistakes of my own and watching other people make group riding errors. Yes, that is hindsight. But the whole point of hindsight is you can use it as foresight for the next time you're out in a group. So it's perfectly possible to use what's happened in the past to predict what could happen in the future. Um, all we're doing basically is um you know is is using experience to build 
knowledge. Um, nothing wrong with that at all. Now, so just to round off, group riding. It can be a great social occasion when everybody works together with each other. And that's really what group riding is. It's team riding. Um, but it can be absolutely a nightmare when we get a group where it's really a bunch of individuals going the same way and all playing by their own rules. Um, and I have certainly experienced a few group rides like that where everybody rode for themselves and they were absolutely awful to ride in. Um, so well, if you are the kind of rider who struggles to conform to group rules, uh, well, maybe it's time to consider not riding in a group. Um, you know, it may sound harsh, but uh, you, you're not going to enjoy it if uh, you're constantly being frustrated by the riders around you and the riders around you certainly won't enjoy your presence in the group. So, yeah, it's a team game, group riding. Ride it, as it, uh, ride it with other people and not um, for yourself. Um, final point on that one. Um, I did suggest a couple of years ago that I would organise some uh, very limited number group rides. Um, I never got any further with the project uh, two years ago for one reason and another. And of course, last year, it wasn't the year at all for doing that. But um, I th I'm going to have a, a, a sort of an eye look at those again. I'm going to put a post up on Facebook over the next day or two about relaunching that, uh, that scheme and getting some of those rides going. Um, there'll be Limited numbers, just sort of five, four or five riders at a time. Um, they'll be fairly short um, and they'll be over roads I know well. So I'll take you at a pace which you can enjoy. Uh, the idea of those is not a sort of knee down uh, exploits or anything like that or huge groups all uh, hogging the road. Um, no, they'll be small, friendly and uh, very personal. And uh, I hope, as I say, I'll get I'll get some information out to you in over the next few days. And I hope people will be interested in those. There was interest two years ago. I just never got around to doing any more about it for one reason or another. Right. OK, just one more comment. Um, oh, yes, Nigel's looked in. Hello, Nigel. Good to see you here. Um, and we have some spam. Excellent. We have spam on the uh, comment sheet as well. So let's uh, get rid of that. Um, so, right, anything else to say? That's pretty much it for the day. Uh, don't forget, if I have done your head in with any of these um, better biking articles, uh, do drop me a line. Um, On-road training is available uh, now. Uh, inexpensive online coaching sessions are also available and uh, people are starting to be more adventurous and take those. Um, the uh, yeah, the little bell icon, uh, if you want an advanced warning about these shows going out, uh, just click on the little bell and that should um, uh, alert you to them. You do need to go full screen apparently to find the bell if you're watching on computer the latest tips on tuesday went up on my coffee page yesterday uh, so if you want more reading material uh, do pop over there and have a look and if you've enjoyed the show you can always support me over there and with a bit of luck i should get a new chips on tuesday post up tomorrow been a bit short of time over the last couple of days because the um the training's gone a bit bonkers right okay that's it for today so uh, i hope you enjoyed the show and i will look forward to seeing you hopefully on sunday at 11 with the next 11s so thanks from me kevin williams for tuning in and stay safe out there bye for now <laughs>